Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. So Mike, thank you very much indeed for that presentation and thank you UCI uh, again. Um, the next panel is on a topic that is really most important to us here, and that is patient and family engagement, because that's something we have to do better with. It's certainly improving, I think, in many institutions, but we can still do more. So the panel will focus on the critical role that patients and their families play in ensuring patient safety and engaging patients and family members as active partners in care can lead to better health outcomes, increased satisfaction, and a reduction in preventable errors. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. Please welcome Steve Barker, Tracy Young, Wanda Waden bates Carol Hemmelgarn, and Joe Carmichael. Thank you. I think this will be an exciting panel. Uh, I'll introduce by saying the, the, the two things that I value most about the patient safety movement and that, that I think make it so strong are one, it, it uses a let's learn from our mistakes approach to solving problems. Let's analyze cases that went wrong, errors that were made, what can we learn from that? What should have been done differently? And then in some ways, the hardest part of that, disseminate that lesson to the whole world. And that's, you know, there are barriers in disseminating cases that went badly. Now, aviation has used that approach for years and it's had a huge effect on their safety. They've done very well with not only accident analysis, but even analyzing near misses accidents that didn't happen but were close. We should do the same thing. Patient safety movement is great at that. The second strength though that I think is even greater and, and to me is just, I say wow every time I come to one of these meetings, is the fact that we involve patients in our meetings, not just as attendees, but as equal participants, speakers, and discussions, and we have actually two of our panelists today uh, have personal experiences with regarding loved ones that you'll hear a little about that uh, started them in the direction of patient safety. Uh, you're, you'll hear four different perspectives of how we're approaching this, and uh, I, I think it's going to be fun. Get, I hope you've learned how to use the Slido app. So I've got the computer, I, and I hope I can make it work at this end. So start typing in your questions, and I'll be looking for them. But we'll start with uh, opening presentations of, uh, of their ideas and, and their orientation. I'm going to, just for variety, uh, vary the format just a little bit instead of reading all four introductions and then starting to talk. I'm going to introduce each one and then have that panelist give their opening comments and then introduce the next one, okay? See, see how you like that, let me know. Uh, my idea is you will have fresh in your mind who they are when you hear what it is they're, they're going to tell you and what they're going to talk about, okay? Without further ado, and I, I really respect this group, we're going to start with uh, my good friend Vonda Bates. She is an alliance builder and organizational development leader. Her collaboration expertise has influenced major market shifts in television, retail, banking, technology, education, and now healthcare. In 2013, she decided to contribute her skills on behalf of safety in healthcare after researching how her husband, Charles Bates, died from one of the most common preventable causes of death, hospital-associated venous thromboembolism. And by the way, as just a sidebar, I experienced that personally, and I know how scary it is, believe me. Uh, advocating for every person in the care system, Vonda brings a compassionate perspective, strategic skills, 
an unstoppable resolve to improve communications and safety for healthcare workers, patients, and their loved ones. She is now the CEO of Tenth Dot, a company founded by her late husband and uh, organizations uh, which consults and trains individuals, teams, and organizations to reach their greatest potential. So, Vonda, this is your 10th year at this summit, and I've talked with you every year, I think, uh, participating as a patient voice for safety. What have you learned in these 10 years, and what have you seen change, and, uh, and what would you like to continue to change? What is your perspective? Thank you. Um, and yeah, it, I mean, what an incredible journey. It's been over 10 years and really 12 years because Yogi Raj died in 2012 in a U.S. hospital from a hospital-associated venous thromboembolism, as Dr. Barker pointed out. And uh, my sense of, of this moment is one of the things that I've learned is that his his personhood, his beinghood was as an educator first and foremost. He was a teacher, a philosopher, uh, organizational development consultant. If he had survived that and had been able to talk about the harm in his own words, I feel quite certain that he would be bringing up something that we heard from Dr. Berwick yesterday. Um, I'm not sure, Dr. Berwick, what your orientation was toward this, but mine is uh, Yogi Raj studied yoga as one of many different disciplines. And within yoga, there's a philosophy in Sanskrit it's called Icha Jnana Kriya. It means will, knowledge, and action. And as I reflect back over these last uh, 12 years, but really the 10 years that I've been an active participant as a family member with a significant loss of, of life in this case, um, that, that is the way I've oriented toward my own personal 10-year retrospective. On the subject of will, I cannot begin to tell you what an incredible relief it was to come into the room with the first summit that I attended in 2014, I believe it was, and realize that, that a strong will existed in the room, not just by folks who have had direct experience of loved ones being harmed or, in my husband's case, uh, dying from preventable hospital circumstances, but also um, in absolute action to increase that knowledge. And in, in that concept of will, knowledge, and action, will and knowledge combine to create action. Over these 10 years, what I've noticed around that will is that it has, at least I think, it is more prevalent within the hospital walls, within the medical center walls, within the medical education walls. That certainly was not my experience at the time. When I first learned that his venous thromboembolism was preventable, I immediately called the hospital and was met with what you can probably predictably um, understand as quite a lot of defensiveness. And it was my impression initially that the will to change this was just simply not there. Over these years, though, I have seen that will grow. I have seen it expand. I have seen it even move into the halls of governance, not just within our medical systems, but also within our legislative systems. And I am uh, very much in action in that regard. On the subject of knowledge, um, initially, you know, when I first sat in this chair on, I don't know if it was exactly this white challenge, yes. but it was one of <laughs> something very much like it. My impression was that um, I was still in a lot of question about whether I was accurate. I was still hearing from family members, from friends, that maybe I was exaggerating. Maybe I was taking this experience of my own and applying it too broadly. And over the 10 years time, what I have come to understand and experience is that uh, we all understand now. I, when I meet with legislators and even family members and, and 
people on airplanes who sit next to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring this anywhere I can. I ask often now and have over the last 10 years, have you experienced anything like this? Do you have a family member? Do you have a loved one? Have you personally? And in the beginning, very, very few people would say yes to that question. Now almost everyone does. And I don't think it's because it has had the experience much differently, although hopefully there's been some ebb and flows in there. But more importantly, I think it's because we now know how to discuss it. We know how to bring it up within our various um, disciplines and environments. And lastly, on the subject of action, the, in the very, very beginning, action was very much oriented toward the person. There was still, uh, and, I, and I know that there is still today, but it has changed significantly in my estimation over the last 10 years, that it was about well, what did the person do wrong? What did the team do wrong? And over these years, it has become much, much more evident, much, much more articulated that these are systems issues. And systems issues can be uh, much more addressed. I'm going to pause there, and then if we get to come back to me, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the changes that I would love to see. But I, I want to make sure that I don't overextend my Thanks, time. Thanks, that, that is great information to hear. And I think that, you, you know, the key is that we are evolving. We're learning as we go along, involving not only the patients and hearing their stories, but and, and as you said, listening. And uh, I, I, I know we're going to continue doing that. Thank you for being here. Uh, Carol, Carol Hemmelgarn is the founder of Patients for Pace, Patient Safety U.S., She's the program director for the executive masters in clinical quality, safety, and leadership at Georgetown University. And she's senior director of education at MedStar Health. Carol got involved in patient safety after the loss of her nine-year-old daughter, Alyssa, due to med multiple medical errors. And I, I hope you all saw the video yesterday uh, if you got through that video with dry eyes, you are tougher than me, I'll tell you. That, uh, that is very moving, and she was absolutely beautiful. Her focus has been on honesty, transparency, and truth-telling after medical harm, and that is a major issue, as you will hear, and spreading, and spreading the implementation of communication and reconciliation programs in healthcare organizations. So Carol, what role do patients and families play in policy and advocacy, and what role should they play in the future? How do you see that developing? Thank you. Well, many of us come into this work by telling our story, as you saw yesterday, but we do evolve over time. Um, we feel this innate, need to make sure healthcare is safer and that we're learning from these mistakes. And through that evolution, we need to get ourselves in the room, in the room where things happen. And that's that first stage. And then we want to have a seat at the table. And then we want our voices heard. But the new phase that we're in now is we are inviting you all into our room. And what I mean by that is when a group of us got together and formed Patients for Patient Safety US, we wanted to drive this from the patient and family level, from the grassroots. And how we've done this is we have gotten involved in a lot of advocacy policy. And to give you some examples of what that looks like, um, there's things called the Technical Expert Panels, TEPs. Um, several of us were involved in the patient safety structural measure, TEP, that you've heard about over the last two days. We are involved in the um, National Quality Forum, reviewing the serious reportable events, part of the diagnostic work. We are getting ourselves on boards, boards like uh, Vonda's on with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, Leapfrog, Solutions for Patient Safety. Next week, or I guess it's in nine days now, is World Patient Safety Day. And one of the other co-founders, Marty Hatley, who's here with me, um, is conducting the march, is leading the march and the Hill visits 
that patients, families, and providers as well are going to be participating in. So there's the saying, um, there's a model by Russell, and it goes, originally we do things to patients, mm -hmm. we do things for patients, we do things with patients, but really what it is, it needs to be done by patients. And that is the evolution that is going on now, that we can help you. We can oftentimes say things that you can't say. We can push the envelope with legislation. We have CMS's ear, HRQ's ear, but we can't do it alone either. So it has to be by and with. And that is really where you'll see a lot of us that have been either personally harmed or a loved one harmed. It's no longer just about advocating, it's actually about activism. Very good. You know, I, I listening to you, I recall the many conversations I've had with patients and families here at these meetings. And it's been, I, I've been an anesthesiologist for 37 years or something like that. I've never really gotten that perspective through the clinical practice. You don't have an opportunity to, to hear the patient's side. And the other thing I, I if, for many of you will share this experience, we will all be patients someday. <laughs> if, you, if you're one of the lucky ones who hasn't yet, just wait, your time will come. And uh, like I said, I, you know, I had a couple of scary events and I, I know what it's like on, on the other side. And we need to, uh, it's more than feel the pain, it's, uh, it's understand the perspective as what, what you were saying and learn how to communicate. And, and again, as I've said in the previous panel, learn how to listen. So um, thank you, thank you very much. Tracy Young is a certified registered nurse anesthetist with 23 years of diverse experience from clinical anesthesia, business leadership, entrepreneurship, and healthcare advocacy. With over 134 hospitals and 1,300 physician anesthesiologists and CRNA employees in six states, Mr. Young is focused on making sure that patient safety Anesthesia leadership development and excellence in anesthesia are hallmarks of the company he co-founded, which is called Essential Anesthesia Management. Mr. Young is also a strong advocate for patient safety and advancement of anesthesia services and research in his role as the vice president of the 63,000 member American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology. So, Tracy, what would you consider to be the biggest challenges in maintaining and increasing or increasing patient safety in today's anesthesia market? Well, first of all, humbled to be here. Um, I am a CRNA, which is an advanced practice registered nurse with, with three years of specialized training in anesthesia. And when I think about when my career started in training about 25 years ago and the advancements that we've made through technology, through pharmaceuticals, trainings, we've really done an amazing job in improving patient outcomes, but we're a unique profession in the healthcare segment, and we're facing some pretty unique challenges right now. You mentioned several in the last panel um, <clears throat> that I'll touch on in a moment, but anesthesia is a service industry. Patients don't walk into hospitals and say, hey, I'm here to be put to sleep for a couple of hours. Yeah. No, they're there to get their gallbladder taken out. They're there, there to get a colon resection, which I've recently had to experience as a patient from, from one of your colleagues, Dr. Carmichael. Um, it's unique being on the other side of the drape yes. and, and being a patient. But in anesthesia, about 50% of the care is delivered from private anesthesia groups that are invited guests into these hospitals. And what that does is it complicates a lot of things. Patient safety, patient engagement, those are always at the forefront, but we get a lot of competing interest. In anesthesia, we serve surgeons. We have to make sure surgeons are happy with our services as well, too. We serve hospital administrators. We have production pressures. The OR is the economic engine of nearly every hospital in America right now. 
So when anesthesia says, we don't think this is safe to do at this moment, we get a lot of pushback, sometimes from surgeons, sometimes from hospital administrators, because we're affecting that economic engine, mm -hmm. but we're doing it because it's best for the patient. So we get a lot of competing priorities quite frequently in anesthesia. And then Dr. Barker, you mentioned it earlier, we're in a critical shortage of anesthesia providers. Mm -hmm. Most of the research and most of the data says we're about a 12% undersupplied in anesthesia at the moment, but many markets are nearly 30% undersupplied. So wow. three out of every 10 operating rooms doesn't have an anesthesia provider able to deliver anesthesia services. So what does that do? <clears throat> that causes a lot more production pressure. We have to do more with less. We're asking the existing workforce to work longer, to pick up extra call shifts, to work post-call. That leads to the burnout, the fatigue that was talked about in the previous panel as well too, which leads to patient errors. And when we're talking about production pressures, where do we cut corners? We don't wanna cut corners in anesthesia anywhere. Anesthesia is about 98% boredom and about 2% sheer terror. Sure. We don't wanna cut corners anywhere in anesthesia. But what typically happens is, a lot of times the patient engagement is where things get cut. And we have a very, very short period of time with our patients and their family members to lay eyes on them, to communicate with them, to build a rapport and to develop a level of trust. We have sometimes two to five minutes, but that is a critical step. Technology helps us, pharmaceutical advancements helps us, but laying eyes and understanding and building that relationship with patients are a critical step because we have another saying in anesthesia. Anesthesia is not only science, but it's also an art. We perfect that art by laying eyes on patients and getting that human interaction and that human connection with patients. So, so for us right now, it's a challenging time, quite frankly, in anesthesia <clears throat> from a business standpoint, but also from a patient care standpoint. And lastly, I, I think I'd like to mention, um, this thought occurred to me and a colleague actually texted it to me during the previous panel is that we probably don't do a good job of taking care of the second victim. You guys are the first victims. When we have a bad event, it affects us oh, yeah. terribly. So we need to do a better job yeah. of working with those providers, bringing them back into the workforce where they're healed and they're able to take care of patients right. safely and effectively again. Sorry, emotional. No, that's a good, very good point. Um, I, I have been there, done that, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're striking a sensitive chord. Um, the, and the teamwork, I, in my perception that I've seen over the last 35 years or so, the surgery and anesthesia are a team. Mm -hmm. And I think that team relationship has actually gotten better over the last 20, 30 years from what, what I started with anyway. Um, we respect each other, we work together, and you know we're trying to accomplish the same goal, which is not only cure the patient's disease, but get them through the process safely without doing any any additional harm. And um, we, I, I think we're doing a better job of, of, like I said, the teamwork and understanding that. So um, yeah, thank you for those comments. And in fact, it's perfect now that our, <laughs> our last team member is a surgeon. And Joe Carmichael, uh, thank you for coming, is a general and colon and re colorectal surgeon at the University of California, Irvine, where I was on the faculty for 12 years, uh, and who also works as the healthcare system's senior vice president and chief medical officer. While he continues to care for individual patients in his practice, he also has responsibility for uh, for an oversight of the quality and safety of care of all patients at UC Irvine. And you saw in the last talk, uh, UC Irvine's new medical center, which is quite impressive. I wish they had had that when I was there. Uh, in his remarks today, Joe will discuss UC Irvine's approach to receiving and sharing patient and family member feedback so that the core elements reach all levels of a healthcare team that involves more than 1,200 co co-workers. And I, as I said at the beginning, you know, one of the difficult steps in this is not just to recognize our mistakes, analyze our mistakes, learn from them, but to disseminate that learning 
to the whole system, not just to our own department and our own hospital. Uh, that's a crucial step. So Joe, thanks uh, for being here. Could you describe how your healthcare system encourages engagements with patients to provide feedback and how you incorporate that feedback in such a way as to ensure an, an impact and an improvement in quality? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And uh, thank you to the panel. It's, 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 uh, it's an honor to be here with you all. And the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, which, uh, you know, I came yesterday with my laptop and, <laughs> and a lot of work to do. <laughs> And I found I didn't open it. Uh, I, and I, I, I just kind of pulled in and I was texting someone some pictures of a slide and I said, this is just very renewing. Mm -hmm. It's very important to me. It's very fulfilling. And I hope, I, I, I'm guessing a lot of us are participating because we've received that. that. Um, patient feedback, family feedback. It's, it's, like, it's like gold out there and you better figure out how to mine it. Yeah. You, you, you have to go get it. Um, and if you're not, um, you're, you're missing out on being a learning organization. Um, why don't we? Um, we can feel embarrassed about our mistakes. Uh, we uh, carry those with us for, forever. Don Berwick spoke about it. I, we, all of us had been in a moment, and we can think back to very specific times in our training, in our practice, when something happened. And, um, and we, don't, we don't want to acknowledge it. Uh, we're ashamed. People, there's a code of silence sometimes. Um, so there's some res there can be some resistance to going out and getting uh, patient feedback and family feedback. But but you've got to do it. Uh, and and I think that over and over the speakers at this this uh, meeting have 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 talked about the importance of that. So how do we do it? How do we encourage it? Um, I was thinking of a couple things. Um, one on the sort of on the heels of Dr. Stamos speaking about a culture, a culture of safety. Um, patients can feel that, right? Um, have you ever been to a restaurant where they felt like you, they didn't really want you there? Uh, it's your privilege, their, you know, your privilege to be yeah, with them. To be. Uh, <laughs> um, and, or have you been to a place where you, you felt encouraged to be there? Um, so that culture, whether it's the folks helping park your car, helping you wayfind, uh, getting you into your anesthesia suite. Um, we're at, so there's, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people who build that culture. And um, that, that has to be worked on. That, that's something you actively nurture. It, it can't fall to the wayside. You, you actually have to invest deeply in it. You have to think about how to encourage it. You have to take a big trip to Disneyland, like right. uh, <laughs> the dean was saying. Um, right. and, and so, uh, there are still some numbers out there. So 11 seconds. 11 seconds is how long, on average, a patient gets to talk before their doctor interrupts them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that number has not changed. Yeah. That's the same number they taught me in medical school yeah. more than 20 years ago. And um, so if our providers are cutting off our patients, are they going to feel like sharing? Um, probably not. Less likely, right? So think about... That's cultural. And so hearing people, seeing people, being with them, really being with them, um, is, is critical to them feeling open to sharing how they feel about their situation. Right. Uh, another, so that's culture. Another thing I was thinking about is the practical things, like um, encouraging patient feedback through finding them where they are. So you, you may call them after their stay. Robocall is less effective, uh, but I know we use a lot of those. <laughs> text messaging. If you're going to text a questionnaire, it can't be too long. Um, it, you'll lose them. They won't respond. Um, and including people, you know, looking for written, digital, and uh, verbal communication and encouraging that through multiple modalities. And then um, another thing is just putting patients, getting patients on panels, getting them on your committees. Um, Let's say you want to buy a thousand new hospital beds. Patients need to be involved in that decision. Yeah. Uh, you know, they need to try out the bed. So you're looking at five vendors. Um, it, it, does this get low enough to the ground for you to get out of? Um, is the mattress, they're like combinations of gel and foam, are they, are they too soft to where you sink in it and you feel trapped? Mm -hmm. And you're going to be, you know, you could fall when you're going to get out of this. Are the controls 
uh, too high up. So if you've got a bad shoulder, you, you can't reach them. And, uh, or are they confusing? Do you, does it look like you're trying to you know, launch a jet uh, with all the controls? Right. Uh, because that's not good either. So that's just an example of like really practical stuff that patients and patient families need to be involved in, but there's many more. And, and sometimes people say at, at the exact, well, I don't know, where do you get people uh, to be? Chances are they've already written you a letter. Uh, and, uh, yeah. when you, and when you receive that letter, look at it. I, I remember one patient, it was actually uh, having to do with detection of venous thromboembolism. Uh, a, a, a patient had written me and um, I reached out to her and she and her husband were on the phone and, and it was into our second conversation. I was just getting information and, and they're fine, but they, they saw, they did, they did well, but they saw an opportunity for improvement. And I said, I don't want to pivot. I, I, I'm still listening to your story, but would you consider serving on some of our committees? What I saw is they were just really great at delivering constructive, insightful information um, and that's where you find folks. That begins to where you, where you can find them. Um, and the, yes, uh, two days ago, a friend of mine was saying, I'm gonna come to your system for everything at this point. I, it's just, I'm converting all my care there. And I go, great, you can be another one of my secret shoppers. <laughs> and you can tell me all about your experience. Because I know when I go out there and I get my care there too, it might be shaped a little bit because they see me coming. <laughs> I think I'm marked. Uh, yeah. But I, I, even, in, even though I feel a little marked as I go through the healthcare system and try to get my care, um, I'm also eyes wide open looking for things. So I think those are, you know, make it an active process. It can't be passive when you go out and get uh, that patient information. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's great. And you emphasize something that, that I said early, learn to be a listener. I keep... I, I say that to my younger colleagues all the time, especially young people that are going into leadership positions like department chairs. It's a skill that it, it, you have to f concentrate on doing it. That's how you get new information. And that's, again, one of the beauties of this meeting uh, that we're hearing all sides, including especially, in fact, the patient side, and, uh, you, you know, it's great. I'm going to go around another time, but uh, I need some technical help. Uh, the Slido is dead. And uh, so. So, Steve, just to say something. Yeah, please, Carol. Silent is the same letters as listen. Say that again. Silent is the same letters as listen. Oh, good point. If you rearrange them. Yes. So the key is we learn more by being silent and listening than we do speaking. Ooh, I will use that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I can't say it often enough. Learning to be a listener, it just, uh, uh, and that's one of the beauties, again, about this uh, society and what we have done. We're listening to the patient side, the families, the loved ones, and you know, those, uh, those lessons are very valuable on the care side. And again, as, as you, you both said something too, we're all going to be patients one of these days. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it can be an eye opener when the first thing, when it happens to you. Um, Vonda, so what, what else have you learned from this discussion? And how would, uh, how would you use that information going forward? What have you listened to? <laughs> what have I heard? Um, I'm going to draw back to the previous speaker, Dr. Stanos, I think. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, he said something that came up in a conversation last night with uh, Brandon Lau, and that is around standardization. I am very, very keen on bringing patients and family members into the conversation around creating some new uh, in technology, I think it's called the MVP, the Minimum Viable Product. And there are a lot of discernments that we need to have in our work together, our collaborations, our coordinations around systems to take this, this intention of care, this original intent of do no harm, 
that has been like almost everything else in our lives, financial, financially um, oriented. And we don't have the level of standardization that we could have, such as what we see in aviation. It's true. It's, it's way more complicated in healthcare. But I don't know that it has to be. And I do think that if we collaborated with the patients and family members who have direct experience and lots of opinions and lots of, of ideas um, to bring to the table, we could make some discernment between what are the problems that we need to solve and what are the dilemmas that we need to manage. There's a very big difference between problems to be solved and dilemmas to be managed. And in organizational development work, that's, like, that's a starting gate for identifying how to move forward together so that, and I don't mean within one hospital or one hospital system, as much as I have concerns about the smaller hospitals becoming bigger hospitals, my hope is that what that is getting closer to is some standardization across nations. And if we can get to that level of standardization so that staff workers, wherever they go, there are certain things like, for example, uh, what was mentioned yesterday by uh, Henrietta Hughes is the Martha's Rule. It's in any hospital in England, no matter where you go, you can escalate. There are a number of those like uh, resolution or reconciliation programs. There are a number of ways I think that we could use our collective voices together, our interdisciplinary or in inter-experiential um, lessons to get to that minimal viable product. And if we aimed at that through research, through collaborations, I think we could make faster headway together towards something that would actually disrupt the um, complications that we have because we're just not simple enough it just keeps getting more complex, and right. we actually need to get more simple. You're right. And this concept of teamwork that we discussed is, is part of that as well. Um, Carol, what are your thoughts on, on this discussion and where it's gone? So I want to weave in a couple of things that you said, um, Dr. Carmichael. So when we were talking about patients doing things by patients. Um, there's something that work we're doing, Sue Sharon's leading it with Marty Hatley and Sue Schrantz, and it's looking at patient-reported measures and patient-reported outcomes. So much of that work was done without the input of really what matters to patients and families in their care, what does safety look like, what does the experience look like. It's the first time that it's being driven, the conversation, by a diverse group of patients, patients with some disabilities, um, maternal fetal disparities. And so what does that look like? And we are inviting in the external stakeholders. We're inviting in the different entities, um, the different clinical practices. So I think it's taking some of this a step further. While it is great to have patients and families test out beds, we need to have patients and families as part of the quality and safety work. Right. That we are sitting on sepsis committees, um, hack work. We are on the boards of quality and safety and experience committees in hospitals. And why that's important is our perspective is ex different, but our life experiences. We come as teachers. We come as architects. We come as fire people. We're going to give you a different look at everything, and what a beautiful opportunity to blend the clinical knowledge, but with other people that have these experiences that look at the world differently. And that is what I think, you know, as you talk about that is, that's a gift. What a beautiful gift to get a different perspective. Yeah. Wow, good point. You know, you, you reminded me, one of the old traditions in, in medical departments in both anesthesia and surgery is usually weekly you have a, a faculty and resident conference that's called m and m morbidity and mortality conference where you go over cases that didn't go right and they may have had a terrible outcome or maybe not a bad but or something went wrong and you review you learn from your mistakes good idea I've, you, you just uh, made me think, why don't we ever have a patient 
come to those meetings. Wouldn't that be interesting to hear their perspective or, or a family member? And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, I, as I said at the beginning, that we have pioneered in this, in this organization. And I, I, want, I want to thank Joe Chiani. Uh, from the, from the get-go in the patient safety movement, we have involved the patients as equal participants, as speakers, as contributors, and we use your, your ideas, the patients and the, the loved ones who were impacted. And, you know, we're all, uh, we're all going to be impacted sooner or later, as I said. Um, Tracy, what, what would you like to add after hearing all of this? Yes, I'm developing this thought as, as, as I'm hearing this. And, and I talked about some of the challenges we have currently. And I'd like to think maybe a little bit about some of the challenges we're going to have in the future. Mm -hmm. We've had technological changes in the last 50 years. If you plucked an anesthesia clinician out of an OR and put them in a modern day OR today, it would seem like a foreign environment to yeah. them. And if you think about 50 years, that's a blip on the, on the spectrum of human history. Yeah. But think about the next three to five years. Yeah. All those 50 years are going to seem like a glacial change compared to what's going to happen in the next three to five years with machine learning, and AI. Mm -hmm. You talked about M&M conferences. That information is getting disseminated to a small group of people. Um, when we learn as individuals from our mistakes, that's an N of one. We're learning that. When we get machine learning, we get AI involved, when they become an integral part of our EMR system and tied into our anesthesia machines, taking real-time data, patient hemodynamics, their vital signs, their expired gases that they're breathing out, and collating that with the entire universe of evidence-based research and offering us real-time suggestions on how to handle that patient and then taking our inputs and following the patient through the system and learning from that globally for everyone else instead of an m, &M of 15 residents yeah. or whatever we're millions of people that machine is learning on behalf of millions of people right. so when i think about that <clears throat> one I'm, I'm awestruck I mean, the next three to five years are going to be an amazing time yeah. in healthcare. But I also think back to the patient and family engagement, because that's the one thing that human connection, that's the one thing the machine cannot do. So right. um, as that thought's developing, the, it's critical that we take the time, develop that rapport, develop that trust with our yeah. patients. Very good. You know, you remind me also, one of the barriers in medicine, as opposed to, say, aviation, of talking about our mistakes and spreading that information is over. Is there a lawyer listening? You know, mm -hmm. The fear of a malpractice lawsuit. And uh, we have got to get over that. Joe, what, what thoughts do you have on I that? I was thinking the same thing. Good. Um, <laughs> perfect timing. Uh, perfect timing. Great lead in. You know, Congress uh, and had addressed this, uh, but we didn't, I don't think we've heard it. And they allowed us to establish PSOs, patient safety organizations that create patient safety work product that is protected information. Mm -hmm. And I think too often we uh, fear gets in the way of, oh, we really can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that could be later used in a suit or something. And I think mm -hmm. there's going to be parties pushing both ways. But I think as, as advocates for patients, we have to uh, push and say, no, we, there are a lot of aspects of this right now that we can share today. Perhaps the report we've heard is even a stop the line moment. Mm -hmm. And it's a message that we need to get out to 12,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, with respect to our legal colleagues, who I deeply respect, right. I, I think there's also a little push a back and forth. And we have to insist that, no, these things get shared. And, and uh, because, and I think the argument is pretty straightforward. It's, we need to prevent the next event. That's right. You know, I know you're concerned about the impact of this one. What about the next one and the next one and the next one? And, and how are we, how are we gonna do that? Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think is, is we've gotten bigger as systems and another barrier that's developed is we've got these massive economies of scale, right? Hospital cons system consolidation is just an everyday report now. And I think you need to probably, as, as executives in the system, we need to trace patient information, like patient report back information and family information, and find out where it's going in our system and who it's missing. Um, often, I even found that with RCAs when we traced 
where that information was going. And there were some folks that I thought should be receiving that information that we were just missing mm -hmm. out of no, it just was where they were in the org chart. It, um, and so I think that is another thing. You can just start actively tracing where it's going, actively looking at each committee and thinking, well, where is the patient advocate on this? So things like that. Very good. You know, the, and the idea of what, what in aviation they call no fault reporting, where you can report uh, a near miss that you had and you're not going to get in any trouble for it. We need that sort of thing in medicine. And I, I think people are starting to realize that. When there's an aviation accident, uh, maybe yeah. a terrible uh, plane accident in the Navy, uh, the investigation is, is very thorough, but it actually does not involve the JAG Corps. Uh, immediately mm -hmm. and so and as they trace back the pilots last 48 hours and how much they slept and were they having mm -hmm. arguments with family or you know did they bang their knee before they got in the cockpit <laughs> all that stuff uh, the Jack course is not involved it's it's right. a no-fault environment yeah, exactly. I think we need to learn from that yeah we do well I think this has been an excellent discussion and I love the you know having this variety of viewpoints and patients represented as I keep saying that is the strength of the patient safety movement um, and thank you and I think this uh, leads us into we're finishing right on time uh, I think it's lunchtime is that correct so uh, one more okay uh, <laughs> thanks a lot everybody thank you